This is Fresh Air. I'm Marty Moscowain, filling in for Terry Gross. Coming up, an interview Terry recently recorded with one of the favorite writers of bedtime stories. If you remember childhood as a place that included complicated emotions, where sibling rivalry flourished, where monsters lurked, and where sadness and fear sometimes kept you awake at night, then you have a friend in children's book author and illustrator, Maury Sendak. His books, which include Where the Wild Things Are, Outside Over There, and In the Night Kitchen, bring to life a distinctly unsentimental view of what we make of our early years. His new book, We Are All in the Dumps with Jack and Guy, is his first in 12 years, and it's Sendak's first book that is not about middle-class kids. We Are All in the Dumps is set in an urban landscape and deals with homelessness, sickness, and hunger. It's based on two English nursery rhymes. Terry asked him to recite them. We are all in the dumps, for diamonds are trumps. The kittens are gone to St. Paul's. The babies are bit, the moon's in a fit, and the houses are built without walls. That's the first one. Second one. Jack and Guy went out in the rye, and they found a little boy with one black eye. Come, says Jack, let's knock him on the head. No, says Guy, let's buy him some bread. You buy one loaf and I'll buy two, and we'll bring him up as other folk do. The the, the first rhyme that, that you recited, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have known what to make of it. I'd have to say it wouldn't have made any sense to me. We well, want to recite it one more sure. time. <clears throat> well, see, there are clues in it for an illustrator. We are all in the dumps, mm-hmm. for diamonds are trumps. The kittens are gone to St. Paul's. The babies are bit, the moon's in a fit, and the houses are built without walls. Now, I think it's extraordinarily beautiful poetry, but it's like haiku. What does it mean? Well, I'm faced with a bridge game, diamonds or trumps. That means somewhere in this book, somebody's playing bridge. Not being a card player, that doesn't turn me on. So I had to learn how to play bridge. Uh, The moon's in a fit. You have to figure out why the moon is in a fit. What does it mean? The kittens are gone to St. Paul's. I mean, what does St. Paul's mean to American children primarily? And then the astonishing, extraordinary line, the houses are built without walls. I mean, that's what moved me all these years to make this work for me. So what did that come to mean to you, the houses are built without walls? It meant, finally, kids who have no place to live. Uh, This really started back in Los Angeles. Uh, At least one detail, and a significant one, began in Los Angeles years ago. I was working on an opera, the L.A. Opera, and we came home late from a rehearsal, and I was driven back to my hotel, and we passed down some very, very posh streets in Beverly Hills. Maybe it was Rodeo Drive, but I couldn't swear to it. And there, past midnight, on the street, in this posh section of town was just a dilapidated, ruined cardboard box with two dirty, naked kids' feet sticking out. The juxtaposition was astonishing. It's as though when everybody stopped shopping and gone home, then these kids came out, or people came out, and every city is ringed round with shanty towns, homeless. We all know that. We have it in New York. We have it in every major metropolis in this country. Um, But it astonished me to see that juxtaposition. I got interested, and I got a book on Rio, Rio de Janeiro, and discovered that there is a ringed round, well-known shantytown, kids' town around the city. And kids are abandoned. They're little girls sold into prostitution. Little boys run away from abuse, from being abused at home, and they make their own cities, and they're as cruel to each other as any adults can be, and their lives are very, very brief. And they live in tin cans and cardboard houses and rag huts and I suddenly began to see what dumps is. We are all in the dumps. Back in the 60s that of course meant you know, if you're in therapy, dumps means you're in a depression um, which is probably why I couldn't make anything sound out of it back then. Now dumps literally means the world. We are all in the dumps is really well describes events around the world at this point. Your new book deals with some real world fears like homelessness Mm -hmm. and um, uh, just uh, uh, being being scared by what could happen to you as a kid now. What were the real big events 
in your life that you found really frightening when you, when you were young? When I was young, the big events were uh, being sick and being expected to die and knowing that at a very early age I might. <clears throat> this was spoken. My parents were very indiscreet. My parents came from a foreign country. They were immigrants. They didn't know about Freud. They didn't know about what to say or not to say in front of children. So... And they loved us, me, my brother, and my sister, but that I suffered a good deal from very severe illnesses, not untypical of 30s children when there were no sulfur drugs and there wasn't penicillin. And You went through all the dire illnesses, and sometimes you just croaked. So it was the awareness at a very early age of mortality which pervaded my soul, apparently, and I think provided me with the basic ingredients of being an artist. Uh, that was critical. And knowing that I was vulnerable and that other children were vulnerable. What did you have? What, what diseases? Oh, you know, scarlet fever and pneumonia twice and whooping cough and chicken pox. It was the pneumonia and the scarlet fever that um, I really nearly did me in. Were you carefully watched over by your parents I when you were sick? I was so carefully watched over. I practically, they practically killed me with watching me, watching over me. Uh, so I was delicate, I was very delicate, and I was not allowed to participate in um, street games, and so that a lot of my early childhood was immediately spent in inventing and imagining, and happily I had superb and still have, thank God, siblings. My brother, who is five years old, has spent a lot of time with me that he might have spent having fun outside in the street, drawing pictures for me and telling me stories, as did my sister, as did my parents. And so I was well provided uh, for in terms of human companionship. Uh, but it left, it's a, it left a very severe mark. In those days when you were sick and everybody was worried about you dying, did you have any sense of what death was? I don't remember that. But I do remember I was a very close companion to death. And I remember a game my father played with me, which he would not exactly call a death game, but did move in that direction, which was that if I lay in bed, which I spent a lot of time doing, and I remember in one particular place we lived in Brooklyn, we moved quite frequently because of financial problems. And just opposite, the foot of my bed, was a window looking out in the backyard facing a just very boring brick wall. And he said, if you... To me, if you looked and didn't blink, if you saw an angel, you'd be a very, very lucky child. Um, and so I did that frequently. And of course, I would always blink because it hurt not to blink. And, and then you didn't see it. And he'd say, well, you blinked, didn't you? And I'd say, yes. And I remember once I didn't blink. And I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> or I imagine I saw it, but it, the memory of it is so vivid I could even describe it to you. Would you? Well, I was lying in the bed, obviously, staring out the window, my eyelids aching, my eyes aching, staring, 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 and something very large, like almost like a dirigible. But it wasn't a dirigible because it was right past my window. It was a slow-moving angel. She, he, whatever, moved very gracefully and slowly coming from left, going across to right, not turning to observe me at all. I don't have a memory of the face, but I remember a memory of the hair, the body, and the wings. I was, it took my breath away. It just moved so slowly that I could examine it quite minutely. And then I shrieked and hollered, and my father came in, and I said, I saw it. And he said, I was a very lucky kid. Uh, you will have noticed angels, and we are all in the dumps. Uh, I'm ups I love angels. I was about to say obsessed. That's hyperbole. I'm not obsessed with angels, but I do adore angels. I've never drawn them in a book, and they do appear in the new book, primarily because so many people have died recently that I have populated my book with their spirits floating around, and they're all reading the New York Times because I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Even up there, you got to figure out what's going on every day. <laughs> So when you saw the angel, did you think that that was a sign that you were going to live or that something well, wonderful was going to happen? I think it put me in alliance with death things, with important things. I, I can't really describe it. I really can't tell you what it meant. It was a very internal feeling, but it came out of 
such a complex awareness as a child of, of the fragility of life. There is a story which I can't prove, but I was told that at a very early age, my parents dressed me. It's a religious custom or superstition from the old country. They dressed me all in white from top to toe so that if God is watching, he would have thought me already an angel and he would not pluck me. And I wouldn't die, in other words. I would be a fraudulent angel. Uh, this is a superstition, and it does occur in old villages in the old country. I don't know that it happened to me. But it's significant that it was a family story, so that it told me how uh, forcefully they were concerned about me. Did you see your parents as being really capable parents who could help fend off death or fend off whatever other problems they no, had? No, no, because they were so vulnerable to problems. They caved in on problems all the time. So I did not see them. And this is not a criticism of them. Their lives were extremely hard. But no, no, I did not see them that way. Now, they were from Poland? They were from Poland, yeah. And they fled before World War One. Yes, they did, just before World War One. They didn't flee. My father left on a lark. Oh, well, what was that? <laughs> he had no cause to come here. My, my grandfather was a rabbi. He was the youngest son, and he was obviously the spoiled younger son of my grandmother. And he actually fell in love with a young woman. And uh, it became a little bit scandalous, and she was put on a boat and shipped off to America. And he sulked and pouted and got money out of his siblings and got on another boat to follow her here. And his family was appalled at his behavior. Uh, because of that trivial behavior, he was the only survivor of his entire family. I mean, all of my uncles and aunts and all of the children were destroyed in concentration camps. My father's grief for his entire life was that his survival was based on such a trivial impulse. He re it really did cause him a lot of grief, especially when he became older. You grew up before the Holocaust. Did was he still really regretful about Oh, it? he was terribly regretful and guilty. I mean, he, was, he had survivor guilt, as did my mother, who had much less cause, because she was shipped off when she was about 17 mm -hmm. to come to America. She was uneducated, untrained in anything. She was a girl. My grandfather, on her side, also a rabbi, had died at a very early age of a coronary, and there was no money to take care of everybody. So she was sent here to do it, to work hard, earn money, and then bring them over just typical. She met my father, they married, and all the first income was spent on bringing one aunt, then an uncle, then another uncle, then another aunt, then my grandmother, till finally all but one brother on her side were all here. And then they were going to turn to my father's side, and then it was too late. That was in the 30s. There was no getting Jews out of Europe at that point. And so growing up during the war, that was tough, um, having to live through that in all its complexity. Colors your life forever. Did your parents talk to you much about the old country? Oh, yeah. Thank goodness. And when my father was um, last year of his life, paradoxically, we had a wonderful time. I took his biography down, which was wonderful. A lot of it was fantasy, and a lot of it was reality, but I was... His biography? Yeah. He wrote life. a biography? He wrote a biography, which is not published. He did write a fairy tale, which... I translated with the help of somebody else and illustrated, and that was published just before his death. Right, uh, right. It's called In Grandpa's House, but his biography is not published, and I don't intend to have it published. It's a private family chronicle. We didn't get much of my mother's life. My mother was silent about that period of her life. I think as a lot of people uh, from Eastern Europe who came to America were. Um, did they seem like aliens to you because, I don't know, they probably, did they speak more Yiddish than English? Yes, they the spoke house? more Yiddish. I spoke Yiddish as a child. My parents spoke English very, very late and very poorly. And we lived in a part of Brooklyn which was teeming with immigrants, mm. either other people from Eastern Europe, Jews, or, or Sicilians. And I couldn't tell the difference. I mean, we lived next to the Sicilians, and I had a real, it sounds like, coy conceit, but it's a fact. I had a real confusion because right across the hall from us was my best friend at one place we lived, Carmine, and his sisters and brothers and his huge mother and huge father just across the hall. 
And I used to run across the hall because they had unkosher food, which is much better, <laughs> much better than kosher food because it was, it was pasta. It was great Italian cooking. And they laughed and they drank wine and they grabbed me and I sat in their laps and they had a hell of a good time. Then you come back to my house and you have these sober cuisine and not so rambunctious family life. And I really did have a confusion that Italians were happy Jews, that they were a sect. <laughs> oh, that's and really that, interesting. And that I, would have a cho- <laughs> that I would have a choice after my bar mitzvah to belong to either the, either the sober sect or the happy sect. <laughs> and they went to a different synagogue where they had pasta. Yeah, I was a dumb kid, let me tell you. I mean, all the parents were, looked alike. They all wore the same dull black dresses, and you couldn't tell the difference. Not to me. My guess is the artist and writer Maurice Sendak, and he's, his books include Where the Wild Things Are, In the Night Kitchen, Outside Over There, and a new book called We're All in the Dumps with Jack and Guy. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Artist Maurice Sendak is with us. One of the, the great controversies about your book, about your books, is you know in the night kitchen when when the character Mickey lands in the batter, he's naked and mm-hmm. there's this like little boy penis that he has, right? Yeah. And there were libraries that wouldn't carry the book or would draw little diapers over him, all kinds of silly things like that. I mean, this was not a sexual image; it was just a naked boy <laughs> image. Correct. Right? I mean, it would have been strange had he not had a penis. Right. But no one has ever discussed that problem. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, the astonishing and infuriating business on that book was that that was it's one of my favorite works, and it's a rather complex work. And to have it all reduced, so to speak, to a child's penis is embarrassing. It's silly. And the fact that anyone could carry on about such an issue, uh, I mean, does not speak well for our culture. Well, here's, here's what I'm wondering. Now, that, that, that book was not about... Mickey as a sexual boy or anything. But I think a lot of kids do have sexual feelings. Maybe well, just a little bit older than Mickey. And I, I was wondering if you ever thought about putting sexual feelings into a children's book or if that would seem like much too far out. Well, I have to I have to correct something you say, or at least I don't agree with something you just said, which is okay. that he, the little boy in the night kitchen, does not have sexual feelings. Of course he does. Um, we have them... Immediately on arrival, <laughs> we may have them in utero. I suspect we probably do, but we just haven't traced that yet. There's nothing in a word that you can do that is not sexual, so far as I'm concerned. And the creative act is composed of its sexual component. As animals, which is all that we are, obviously, uh, there's nothing we can do that isn't sexual, thank God. And I don't mean by saying sexual, that is vivid, livid sex. I mean the component of sexuality, sensuality, eroticism is part of everything. And it's what blesses our life. And instead of seeing it in an accusatory way, and I don't mean you, I mean culture in general, uh, or blameworthy way, rather see it for the beautiful thing that it is. Uh, it's, we can't do without it. I I remember I interviewed you, um, uh, oh, I don't know, eight years ago or something. Something that you said really stuck with me. You were talking about the the monsters and where the wild things are, and you were saying that um, when you were young, the monsters were, were just adults. There were people with, like, moles on their faces mm-hmm. and hairs growing out of their noses. Yeah. And, all, and, uh, all, all relatives, actually. Yeah, all yeah. relatives, exactly, relatives, yeah. exactly. And that, that, that really uh, struck a chord. <laughs> <laughs> And then I started thinking, well, I'm one of those people now. I mean, I don't know if I actually have hair growing out of my nose, <laughs> but, but you know, I have some of those things that I'm sure kind of like scare kids. Oh, sure. And do you have your sense of yourself as that too? Of, of like, course. you know, a monster to some kids? <laughs> of course I have. I, I see it in their eyes. Uh, when I'm autographing books, which I don't like to do much anymore, and children are shoved at me. Yeah. They have no idea why they're on the line. They'd much rather be in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and they're standing online, and they're being told something which is so frightening and confusing, which is being told by mom or dad. This is the man you like so much, honey. This is the man who did your favorite book. And they clutch their book even closer, because that really means he's going to take it away. Because if this is the man's favorite book, then he's going to take your book. And the look <laughs> of alarm and the tears, and they stare at me like pure hatred. Who is this elderly, short man sitting behind the desk who's going to take their book away? Then on top of that, the parent says, I give him your book, honey. He wants to write something in it. Well, there they've been told, don't write in a book. Okay? Why then is it all right for a perfect stranger to write in their book? It's horrible for them. And I become horrible. Uh, unwittingly, I make children cry. 
They cry when, when they cry when they meet me because they don't know what I'm doing, and only when they're uh, it's quicker with girls because girls are smarter than boys. We all know that they grow up faster, and girls by the time they're seven or eight already know the business of autographing and what it means. Uh, boys don't till they're about forty, I think, uh, and so they'll pull it away. There's only one child. Uh, who ever had the courage, and his father was urging him forward, urging him forward. I can see the hesitation. I just felt so bad for the kid, and I put my hand on the book to help draw it away from him, and he literally screamed and said, don't crap up my book. <laughs> <laughs> it was the bravest, the bravest cry I've ever heard. I nearly wept. <laughs> so what'd you do? <laughs> well, I, I took the father aside because I think, <laughs> I think the father was going to kill the kid because <laughs> he'd embarrassed him and made everybody laugh. And I had to sit down and say how great I thought his kid was and not, not to be angry with him because the child just didn't understand what this whole nonsense, this social nonsense of autographing was all about. And it would be criminal to punish him for this. This is great. Every time you do a book signing, it's kind of like dysfunctional family in America. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It comes into psychiatric sessions. <laughs> you must feel awful, though. You know, because you're, you're being misunderstood by the kids who, who, who love your books. Well, frankly, that's why I do not visit children in classrooms. Mm -hmm. That's why I've stopped autographing for the most part. Uh -huh. For that very, very reason, it's such a paradox that I, who adore them and I'm interested in their welfare, should become their enemy. It's only because it's set up that way. If I'm to visit a school, they're all warned, threatened, and browbeaten for three days before I get there. Now I want all of you to be nice, and you must raise your hand, and I want everyone to go to the bathroom before Mr. Sendak comes. I mean, their, their lives are ruined. So why should I be the person who does that to them? Oh. Maurice Sendak's new book is We Are All in the Dumps with Jack and Guy. He is also the founder and artistic director of the Night Kitchen Theater Company. This is Fresh Air. Fresh Air senior producer is Danny Miller. Our engineers this week are Richard Parker, Audrey Vablitis, Chris Fraley, and Joyce Lieberman. Dorothy Faraby is our administrative assistant. Roberta Shorrock directs the show. For Terry Gross, I'm Marty Moscow-Wayne.